Hello everyone, my name is Amanda and I am here to share a little bit of an update on my own spiritual journey and my process um, in rediscovering a past life in the Civil War. I released a little documentary I made uh, about this experience a few months ago, but there have been some developments that I thought were important to share and I'm being asked to share them. <laughs> so uh, I just want to start by saying this is my experience and this is and it's my experience as I understand it in this moment that ha is an ever-evolving thing and so as I grow and learn and go further on my path I discover new things all the time so keep in mind that this is a snapshot of my thoughts and experiences at this point in the journey it's by no means, you know, I'm not, I'm human. I don't know everything and I don't have the answers to everything. So I just want to caveat with that. And I also want to say that if this past life experience thing resonates for you, uh, I'm going to post some links that might be helpful for you in your own journey below. Also understand though that I don't believe that everybody is meant to have this experience. This is my experience. It's what my soul needed to understand certain lessons, but I don't believe that, you know, if we all have past lives, maybe not all of us are meant to know about them. They might not be relevant for you to understand in your current incarnation in this lifetime. Maybe you only have one lifetime as a human. I'm. I'm not here to tell anybody else what their story is. I'm here to share mine. So I just want that to be clearly said before I go into anything else. I want to honor everybody's experience and honor everybody's path. So uh, I'm not a guru. I'm not, you know, I don't know everything. <laughs> and I'm not going to pretend to. I don't even feel that I understand everything about my own experience and I'll know as I need to know. I think it's important before I talk about anything else to talk about the idea of soul contracts because this has really been a framework to help me understand my own experience. So there is an idea in the spiritual community that before we incarnate here on earth we gather together the souls that are going to be key players in our lifetime um, and we decide certain, I'm going to say checkpoints, uh, certain things, certain ways we want to meet up, certain catalysts we want to be for each other. Um, so people who you have a deep resonance with, people who are part of what I would call your soul family, your soul connections, some people call them soulmates. Um, these key players in our life, and, and what I'm talking about are the people you meet and you understand that your life will never be the same for having met them. They've, they propel you into some new path, they believe in you a certain way, there's something important that happens when you connect with them. And this could be somebody that you run into one time and never see again. This could be somebody who stays in your life your entire lifetime. It could be a parent, sibling, a uh, friend, could be a lover. Um, I believe we have soul connections and soul contracts with a lot of different uh, people on our path and for varying reasons. So understanding that framework has helped me really integrate my own experience because we can often, and I do this a lot, um, we get to a place where we're asking why, oh, why is God punishing me, <laughs> why am I having this experience that's incredibly painful, and for me a lot of times on this path it's been why am I remembering really intense trauma you know because they say that going into a past life 
uh, it's supposed to be a healing experience in order to um, heal from trauma that is either still stuck in your cells or still in, um, caught in your energy field in some way. And so I've had a lot of moments though where I just felt like I was reliving pain and suffering, uh, tragedy, trauma, but I wasn't really getting to the point. Um, I wasn't getting to the feeling of being at peace with what had happened. Uh, or every time I thought I had gotten there, I would get, you know, pushed back down to a place of darkness. So it was helpful for me to understand that the things that happened in that past lifetime were things that me and that other soul agreed upon. So this idea that we knew on a soul level, we understood the mission we came there to do. On a human level, we still had to play out what had happened and feel all the human emotions and go through all that. But that, that sense of always being protected and never being put through an experience that I wasn't equipped to handle, uh, that was very important for me to eventually understand. Um, yeah, uh, and I just want to say I'm kind of talking off the cuff, so I hope that all of this stuff ends up making sense. Uh, take what matters for you and take what resonates and just, just kind of toss anything I'm saying that doesn't make sense out the window, but so let's, let's start with this. I, if you watched the, the initial video I made, that was kind of, I think, phase one of this whole discovery process. And then you, you kind of graduate and you learn some things and then you have to go dive deeper in. And so this summer I went to, I revisited a few of the places that I had gone to before and I also got the chance to go to some new locations that I had really been hoping to see the first time around. Uh, let me think, where did I go first? Well, one very important experience that I had, I was able to go visit the home where Sally Dandridge lived. Uh, well, she was born, grew up there. Uh, I was able to visit there thanks to the uh, wonderful woman who lives there now. Uh, and I, she is actually still a member, she is a member of the family uh, that originally owned the home. So that was really incredible. Uh, I am going to keep a lot of her information and all of that private uh, out of respect for her and her family. But I do want to say that that was a pretty incredible moment for me. You know, you show up at somebody's home and you essentially tell them that you're their great, great, great aunt from a past lifetime, even though you're in a 24 year old body <laughs> and you're not really sure how you're going to be received. And I will say this woman received me with open arms. We had an incredible conversation and to be able to be there, to go into the house and to hear about the family history and to talk about my own story and be received with acceptance was really incredible. And before, actually I should say, before I got there, I had stopped to do some research in the archives in, in North Carolina and I was able to read some documents and touch in my hands some documents from our family way back, you know, in the 1860s, from way back in the 1860s. And that was a pretty incredible experience. And I will have to, I will say, I, as I was reading these letters and looking at these words, I could feel, I could feel my family around me. I could feel like, well, I guess this is the part of this whole experience that has been rather humbling for me is 
a lot of the people's stories that I'm going into and digging up, these are people who essentially have been lost to history. So nobody's really gone looking for their stories before, uh, beyond maybe surface level. You know, you'll hear, if people know things about John Pelham, they will know who Sally Dandridge is, but nobody really has gone into her story or her family's, her family's story very deeply, at least not from what I've found. So to be able to open these letters and read their words, I think that meant a lot to them, to those spirits, but also for me, it's a profound connection and a profound call to tell people stories who haven't had a voice. And that was part of what actually I discussed with this woman who still lives at the Bower. We, we talked about how people come to visit her home and they're looking for the romanticized version of the Old South from the Civil War. So they're coming wanting to hear about the romance and the, you know, gentility and the story she tells them is this. She says, yeah, we threw some pretty great parties back in the day. And then all the men went off to be shot. And as we were talking, I really could tell that she got it. Uh, we talked about how the story of the Old South in a lot of ways was a story that was invented to help people cope with what they had lost. So there's a lot of deep trauma that I believe is actually still around from the Civil War. And I think I talked about that in my initial videos too, that when we don't address trauma, when we don't heal from it, when we keep stuffing it further down, it stays uh, and there's actually some research that's been done that says that we can house upwards of 14 generations of trauma in our DNA and so if we're not addressing these issues if we're not healing emotionally spiritually physically mentally then we just keep giving this pain down down the, the line and it was pretty incredible for me to speak with to speak with her and and hear how she understood the way her family was really traumatized by the Civil War now I want to say that in some ways you know was that it there's a lot of complicated stuff to talk about when we when we talk about this and I don't want anyone to hear that I am glorifying or justifying anything that was done by the people of the south to others that was negative I'm not trying to say that um, that slavery is okay <laughs> I'm not trying to say that uh, there, there, there were a lot of things going on that were corrupt and weren't okay. But I also want to say that the, the people who went through the war definitely paid for that, the pain that was caused. Um, and I think, again, these families still are paying. These people still are paying for the emotional cost. You know, I really think... Yeah, I just feel like the pain and the suffering and the trauma doesn't stop until we stop hurting each other in an endless cycle. And that's been a big message that has been coming through for me from uh, these people who have passed on is I believe the narrative has been incredibly corrupted and and maybe that's why they're talking to me is they want to set the record straight that this 
the divisiveness that we see in our world today is precisely the problem that we need to start looking at the complexity of the human experience and our own pain because uh, if we're if we're not addressing our own pain it's really hard to to address uh, the suffering of the world on a larger scale so I think our own journeys of self-discovery actually have a greater impact on the world at large than maybe we give credit for. And maybe that was a bit of a tangent, um, but I just felt like that needed to be said. So anyway, um, we had this conversation about, you know, what, what, what did this mean? What did this um, pain that the family went through what is it you know and this is for me too trying to process why did I go through this why is this trauma resurfacing for me why am I having to relive this experience um, because I've seen reconnecting with John has been one of the most beautiful experiences of my life and also the most challenging because I have gotten to see that love transcends everything. If we once shared love with another soul, that bond cannot be severed. True unconditional love is forever, unbreakable, completely timeless and deathless. And that I see really, really clearly and I have felt it very clearly which is an incredible gift in this world because I think we live in a culture where if people are not giving us what we want, oh, cut it off. If it's not easy, throw it away. And real deep unconditional love calls us to show up in a completely new way. And John has showed me He's showed me how to do that. At the same time, there's been a lot that has come up for me emotionally. Uh, there have been times where essentially I get a PTSD response. Uh, and when I get into a certain trigger, I will just see, I will see the image of him in his coffin over and over again like it's like that image will just be in my mind uh, when I'm in a trigger point I've had yeah I've had some weird physical body responses to some of this stuff uh, headaches in the location where he received his mortal wound insomnia problem you know I, I'm not gonna sugarcoat I think transparency is really important so going through this journey, it's not just because it's the work that I need to be doing doesn't mean it has been easy or I have not had moments of wondering why this is happening to me. Uh, and in addition, it's I think opened up a lot of my psychic abilities which can be very overwhelming at times. Uh, I've had moments where I feel as though I can understand what an autistic person feels like when their uh, senses are overstimulated. Um, so, there's definitely growing pains when we go into this work and we go on this journey. And so I don't want to, I'm sharing this because I feel like this is the kind of thing that not enough people talk about and I know there were times on my journey where I felt like I didn't understand what was happening to me or why and I thought that my physical symptoms and experience was odd or there was something wrong with me or I was doing something wrong. So I just want to say that if you're having this type of experience and you're experiencing physical discomfort, emotional triggers, um, mental uh, stress. The most important thing for me has been to seek out help, 
so I when I I take re I try to take really really good care of myself and that's take care of my physical body my emotional spiritual body my mental health um, I have not tried to do this journey alone and so you don't have to either uh, just letting you know and I feel like I kind of lost my train of thought like I said I'm, I'm just talking um, and I hope that something I say lands. As we, so the time I spent at the house was really special to me. And the interesting thing was in the research that I've done into the family, there were still a lot of questions and there were, there's a lot of mystery surrounding John and Sally's story actually. Uh, some of that has to do with houses burning down and letters being lost. Some of it has to do with just the way stories were passed down incorrectly. And I actually was able to share with the woman who lives at the house now, I I actually taught her some things about her family that she didn't know before, so that was pretty cool. And one of the, I kind of had two main questions still, uh, which was why I was kind of on this quest. And one of them was, what really happened to Sally? Um, because like wh what really was her life like because you know the story went that after John died basically all that you could find about her was that she got married and died in childbirth and by all accounts she was still very sad about John's passing at the time of her death and that was about it um, also Pretty much nothing was known about her husband, Blackburn Hughes. So I had some ideas about who he was to me or how he was, but I, I felt like it was unfair to make a judgment when I don't, I didn't recall anything about him. Uh, and I had gone in with this assumption that, well, I guess maybe Blackburn Hughes wasn't very kind to Sally if, if I don't remember him, if she died still sad about John, well, maybe he wasn't a very, maybe Blackburn wasn't a very good person. Uh, what a judgment, right? Uh, <laughs> but as I was speaking with uh, the woman who lives at the Bower, she offered this thought to me and she said, you know, think about it this way. Blackburn Hughes came back to a county that had lost most of its men who were of marriageable age. So there are all these young women looking to get married and very few men for them to marry. And uh, Sally herself had three other sisters that were still living at home who were all of marriageable age. So Blackburn came back to this county and he chose Sally to marry. He could have had any girl in the county and he chose her. Why? Um, and she offered this thought to me like maybe he really did love her or tried to. And wow, I had never thought about it that way before. Um, I think it's really easy to get caught up in the romance of, oh, you know, lost love, soldier goes off to war and dies and she's never, she never got over it. And it seems romantic. It would seem romantic also for me to put the lens on the story that oh I'm I'm finding out about all this because John's supposed to come back and find me in this lifetime and he's my one and he's my soulmate and he's coming back so I should spend my life looking for him and all along that has not ever been the message he's sent me 
John has always sent a message very loud and clear that what he wants for me is to be loved the way I deserve. But it's pretty clear to me that he is in spirit. He is not in a physical body in this lifetime. He's acting as a guide. And really what's between us, you know, love doesn't ever get severed, but it transforms and it can change into other forms. And at this point, the love between us is that he's guiding me and protecting me and looking out for me on the spirit realm. But it isn't that he's asking me to put my heart on hold or put my happiness in this lifetime on hold, waiting to be reunited with him. That is not, and I would argue that is not unconditional love at all. And he's here to show me unconditional love. And so I guess what I was saying though is it's easy to romanticize and get into that place put an idea of what you think you're supposed to be learning onto an experience, but if there's anything I've learned on this journey, it's that I've constantly been asked to surrender what I thought I knew. Constantly being asked to kind of let old version, old ideas, old thought forms, old versions of who I thought I was, it's kind of like you're constantly having to kill something off, which can be very painful and, and hard. Um, but it's always opened me up to new understanding and it's been really worth it. And do we really want to hold on to the thing that's not true anyway? You know, I don't. Um, I'm looking for what's true and, and that's ever evolving and ever growing and that's what's beautiful about living. But I do want to say um, the comment that was made there put me on a whole new quest to discover, okay, what is, now there's this layer of Sally's life, her life with Blackburn that I never put much energy into before. And frankly, it's difficult to find information about Sally and even more difficult to find information about Blackburn, which of course just made me more determined to do so. And I'll say the things that I found were quite incredible. Um, first of all, I discovered that Blackburn and Sally not only had one daughter, they had two. Their first daughter was named Lena Dandridge Hughes and she died at age three months. Uh, the record didn't say of what she passed. Um, it didn't say, but I didn't even know that child existed. She had been completely erased from the narrative. And there was also a daughter named Sally Dandridge Hughes, who was nicknamed Birdie. And she died at 15 months. Also, the record did not say what she died of. But, so this whole idea that Sally died in childbirth clearly wasn't true. She was able to deliver two girls. But then there's this whole other layer of loss of, oh, well... So she lost John in the war and she lost both of her children. And Sally only lived three years after um, Birdie passed away. And I also was able to find the death record for Sally. And she passed away from uh, congestion of the heart, I think is what it says. So congestive heart failure. Weird thing about that is when somebody dies of congestive heart failure, the first thing that happens is the blood to their extremities gets cut off. And in this lifetime, I have a condition called Raynaud's phenomenon that gets triggered by stress and also by the cold. And it basically, my capillaries cut off circulation to my extremities, so my hands and feet, um, change colors or and it's very easy for me to get frostbite um weird a <laughs> weird connection there but i uh spiritually heart conditions that that often when we have heart conditions that's connected to us holding on to grief um 
So the fact that Sally died at 40, which was still fairly young for that time period, she died at 40 of congestive heart failure. I think she was just carrying a lot of grief that she wasn't able to process at that time, which explains why I'm now processing it in this lifetime. Some things I discovered also about her husband. He was a lawyer and he worked for, he worked in Richmond for the Confederate government, <clears throat> writing cases and such for them during the war. So he never, he wasn't a soldier, he never fought. Um, and he apparently died of what, what was listed as inflammation of the brain. And the source that I read linked his death to um, financial stress, which is very interesting. Uh, I also discovered I found his last will and testament he remarried a woman named Mary Perry, who was 22 years his senior or his his junior, and had a son with her. Um, and again, none of the historical record mentions anything about that. In fact, there is the only connection I found that linked him to Mary Perry was his his last will and testament. He's not connected to her on findagrave.com. Like, it's crazy. Um, it just seems like nobody's taken the time to put together the other pieces of this story, which I guess is why I'm doing it. But Blackburn is buried next to Sally. He's not buried with Mary, which I thought was interesting. Um, again, I had held this preconceived notion that there wasn't love between Sally and Blackburn. And the thing I've really had to sit with for a little while is this idea that, and my belief is now, that I believe that Blackburn really did love Sally. He did try to love her. But because of her grief, she was so closed off to being able to receive it. And that's, kind of a flip of the coin for me for the way I had been looking at it I had been looking at oh this you know seeing seeing Sally as the victim of life a little bit I guess oh you know she lost the love of her life she never got over it but what a shame really what a shame that she had the opportunity to have love with another person and was unable to take it Ooh, uh, that was a tough one for me to swallow because now your now your grief your pain has also harmed your loved ones and maybe your grief is justified you know but if we're not able to find ways to heal and move on it causes even more damage and I think that is a huge takeaway from all of this for me. And in this, it it's had a lot of connections and parallels in my current lifetime and in things that are going on now. So I guess what I've been learning to do is put these spirits to rest in order to be present in my current lifetime because we can take the love with us. We can take the love we've shared, the lessons we've learned with us. But if we carry the heaviness with us, that starts to damage things. And I think the reason to, what do they say? That the wound is where the light enters. That our hearts need to be broken open in order to in order to be fuller and you know, we have to break our heart our heart has to be broken a little bit in order for us to open up to great love and so my whole journey here has been to find the gift in the situation to find you know to mine the gold out of the muck and I'll say 
when you have experienced deep pain, deep trauma, grief, while you wouldn't wish it on anybody, I think what it allows you to do is have a depth of compassion that you never would have found before. And in my current lifetime, I've been asked to be really brave in love. Um, and that's uh, romantic love, also familial love, uh, friendships. The gift I have to give is presence through people's pain because I've been there and I know what it means for someone to sit next to you through grief and not leave because of fear. <clears throat> I think I think that's really it is as we sift through our pain, number one, we learn to have deep compassion for ourselves. I've had to have a lot of grace and compassion with myself through this process. It's hard to not feel like you're going a little bit insane when you're having trouble getting out of bed, having trouble eating, uh, having a lot of uh, physical discomfort over somebody you lost over 150 years ago. And you're like either Either what I'm experiencing is the most magical thing or I am the craziest person who's ever lived. <laughs> and that's where I've been at, you know, is do I trust myself and my experience and honor my truth and my experience or do I shut it down, close off, label myself crazy and, and deny my truth? And I feel I've chosen the braver option, even when it's hard. Um, but I've had to have such grace um, and compassion for myself in discovering all of this, in learning how, you know, in relearning how to be who I am. Uh, because if you had told me a few years ago that this would be what I'm talking about, this would be my experience, I never would have believed you. And I think in that journey of learning how to have compassion for my own experience, my own truth, that has helped me have great compassion for what other people are going through. It's allowed me to sit with loved ones who are having a hard time and not judge them or try not to judge them as much as I possibly can, to hold space for other people's experiences even when it's very uncomfortable for me. I had somebody say to me recently, they couldn't understand why I was sticking around and they said to me, most people don't love like that. And my response to that was, most people don't love very well, in my opinion. Most people don't love with the depth that we're all really capable of. And so I think if there's anything to be taken from my story, it's that it's that love is the most transformative force in the entire world and it changes things slowly gently but really profoundly and I think if every day people could learn to show up a little bit braver in love every day, the whole world would look different. Um, that's really my belief. Um, and I think this whole idea, the thing about past lives is what, it humbles you because you realize 
anything you're looking outside of you and judging somebody else for, you've probably done. So when I get frustrated that somebody is closing off or shutting down from a place of wounding and pain and grief, how can I judge them for that when I can look back and say, I was that person. I was that person who couldn't receive love because I was shutting down. And so maybe there's the gold here is if, if we can learn to look outside of ourselves at what those in our lives are doing and say, I've been there before. I am you, you are me. We are reflecting each other's experience. If we can do that, we can have greater compassion and greater love. We can show up with more light in this world. And I think that that's the goal, right? And there have been times I'm like, wow, how ironic um, that a an artillerist <laughs> from the Confederacy who innovated, he was an innov innovator of warfare, John Pelham. It, it has always struck me as interesting that he didn't come back to whisper in somebody's ear about military tactics. He didn't come back to he didn't come back to perpetuate war or justify any of the acts of war that he did in his lifetime. He came to speak love into my ear. And to me, what does that say? I think it's, it's about time that we stopped loading our cannons with, with you know, ammunition. That was anything other than, man, if we could spread some love bombs in this world, I think things would be different. And I think that's what he wants me to say. Um, and so I guess the takeaway for this, for me at this point, is to understand that in embracing the things that I've lost, the pain that I've had, in embracing all that, I've become such a different person. Um, I hope in a good way. And, you know, there have been times where it just feels like, don't, you talk to God and you're like, don't ask me to give up one more thing. I've seen loss and loss and loss, you know, and I'm doing this research and the body count is just mounting. And you're seeing everything you've lost and you feel like there's, nothing's mine. <laughs> I can't keep anything. Uh, I can't make anyone stay. Um, and you feel like you're just trying to hold on to sand and it's just like slipping through your fingers. I've felt that. But then you kind of look at it differently and you say, I don't own anything or anyone. Nothing is mine. And what that means is you appreciate this moment. You appreciate these seconds that you have with the people that you love and care about. You it actually makes me physically ill to take people for granted or see others take other people for granted because I know that it's it, we have now and you know we can't lose love I know that on on some higher level we can't lose love but I think we can miss we can miss the moments that we have with the people we love uh, and really treasuring the people in our lives, the connection we have, honoring the spirit in each other is the most important thing. And so I think if loss had to teach me that, 
I'll accept that. And I'm going to just loop back around to something I was saying at the beginning about soul contracts and what we've agreed to. And for a long time, it was why on earth, why did you have to take him? You know, he's 24, he was 24 years old, I was 23. Why did I have to go through that? Why do I have to keep reliving that? But I now understand that that was John in my agreement. Uh, and there's something I read recently that really resonated. And it was about whales. Um, and this idea that in ancient times, the spirit of the whale understood that sometimes whales... Now, this is a story, so take it for what it is. The idea is that a whale would beach itself making that sacrifice to die in order to feed an entire community of people. Understanding that that one lifetime of that whale was less important than their survival of the whole, the greater good of the whole. So this idea of sacrifice. And that helped me understand that John and I agreed to go through that pain, to go through that sacrifice and that split for a higher reason than maybe I understand right now. That sometimes our individual story, our individual pain is less important than the plan that is in motion for a larger whole. And I don't think we ever get to fully see, not as humans, I don't think we ever get to see the larger plan or fully understand our place in the whole. We can just try to follow what we feel is right and most in alignment as closely as we possibly can. And I wanna say too, the crazy thing about this whole experience, it was scary for me to share my initial experience with all this, that original video I made. Um, I also really put off making this video and talking to you about this because these are some deep uh, personal lessons, personal stories that I've been going through and that's hard to share. The crazy thing is that when I was brave enough to share this experience, it actually connected me to some people I never would have met otherwise. Um, I have people that I've met because of John Pelham, which is really funny. And again, deep soul connections, people who have come forward and reached out to me because of my connection with John. And so it's really crazy because I think when you do start taking those steps that you're guided to take and being brave enough to show up authentically, you start to get markers that show you that you're on the right path and you're doing the thing that you're here to do. And one of the people who contacted me when they heard my story, she expressed to me that my bravery to share my story helped her be brave enough to explore her own. And so I really can't undercut the value of our stories that I want you to hear, that your story matters. And I don't mean you have to make YouTube videos and share your tales with the world, but I mean you showing up authentically with other people and being exactly who you're here to be has such a profound impact on the world that I think we can't underestimate. And so if there's anything that you take out of my story, it's that what are the ways you can share yours? How can you show up in the world more authentically? What have you been putting off that you wish that you were doing? How can you be braver every single day? That's what I hope people walk away with. 
regardless of what they think about what I have to say. Um, and I just want to send all of you so much love and light in this world that sometimes tries to beat us down. Um, yeah, it's not easy to be here all the time, but if we're here, we're here for a reason. And you matter, and I want you to hear that. Uh, so just sending lots of love, and until next time.